Hello everyone and thank you for joining the 22nd Argus Community Call. Today we invite Brecht Seinen, Senior Policy Officer from Open Sci for Open Science at Science Europe, to an interview with Eli Papadopoulou, Product Manager of Argus. They will also engage in a discussion with our community about the challenges and opportunities of creating, publishing and evaluating DMPs. During the presentation, we kindly ask that you keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. For the Q&A session, which will last around 25 minutes, feel free to unmute and turn your camera on if you'd like to actively participate. You can also submit your questions either in the chat or in our shared Google Doc, which will be posted in the chat. And please note that the session will be recorded, and if you wish to participate in the Q&A but prefer not to be included in the recording, let us know in the chat and we'll ensure your contribution is edited out. So, Ellie and Brecht, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. Thank you so much for the introduction, for the moderation of the session. Uh, yes, uh, hi everyone. This is actually the first uh, community call after the summer break. Uh, it, it took us a long to, you know, recover from, from summer, but uh, we got there. Uh, like today, uh, we wanted to also celebrate with all of you the uh, Open Access Week, the International Open Access Week, which is all about community, uh, over commercialization. So we are the Argus community. That's why we thought it's good to uh, invite someone from a community as well, <laughs> but of funders, a uh, different type of uh, stakeholder to come and talk, to, talk with us and share uh, what they've done uh, that can help us uh, with the DMPs and uh, yeah, chat about uh, the future maybe of the of the DMPs and how we see things moving forward. Um, with that, I would like to welcome you, Brecht, and thank you so much for uh, joining us. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just get right into my uh, presentation that I've shared here, and then I will first walk through that. I think now you should see my screen full screen. Yes. Yes, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brecht Salen. I am Senior Policy Officer for Open Science at uh, Science Europe. I was invited, very kindly invited, to talk a little bit about our work on uh, international alignment and sustainability of research data. We've done quite a bit of work on that uh, in the past, I should say. It's already a couple of years ago, but as I'll unpack in my presentation, we are trying to get back to it in the near future. Um, but let me first sort of take a step back, uh, give you a bit of an overview of sort of where are, am I coming from? What is Science Europe exactly? For those who don't know, uh, Science Europe, we are the representative body uh, for our members, which are research funding organizations uh, and research performing organizations, public funding bodies and research performers uh, across the entirety of Europe. Uh, that means that in 29 countries, we have about 40 member organizations now. And you can see a couple of them you can sort of find in your own country uh, which ones uh, we represent. But essentially, we are a representative body. We are a policy body bringing uh, these organizations together. What that means, uh, for example, on open science is that I lead a working group on open science uh, that consists of the experts working on open science of all of our members. And they are the experts. They know their work. They know what they're doing. My job from the policy side there is to try and create spaces where they can work together on issues of uh, shared interest or uh, work or, or or explore issues that are sort of emerging that might not be a priority yet, but are coming in the future. So that's what I would do with them. And then at the same time, grounded in those discussions and the work that they do together, uh, being the experts, I try and build that in a way that here where I'm based in Brussels, that that is also something that finds its way into policy platforms, that uh, policymakers are aware of what is happening in the research community and how they can sort of uh, accommodate that. That is essentially what I do and what Science Europe does. Open science 
is one of the big uh, strategic priorities for my organization. Uh, what that means is that a couple of years ago, the governing board decided we had done a lot of work on open access to publications, open access to research data. Uh, and But they said, let's make open science the umbrella and let's explore while we continue working on open access to research outputs, let's explore what else we can do under that umbrella of open science. And that is where we are now. Let me, before I go to research data and so the practical guides that we published in the past, let me first just very quickly run through a couple of survey results that we published last year that I think are interesting just to illustrate what it is that we're talking about. If I sort of talk about open science, what it means beyond open access. We last week, you might've seen this uh, published survey results that we did with our members. And I'm just gonna show you two that are sort of relevant to tell the story very briefly. The first one is, it was the very first question that we asked in that survey is, do you as an organization, either as a funding body or research performer, do you have a documented strategic approach on open science or any of its elements? That could be that they have a general open science policy or they have a policy specifically uh, on open access publications, data, another element. And the result of that, of that very broad question, admittedly, was this, is that basically all of our members, and we had a, a high response rate of 36 of the 40 members replied to this. You can see there at the bottom, only one of them said, no, we, we don't have a strategic approach on paper right now, but we are planning to have one in the future. All the others said, yes, we have something at some level. Uh, and what that means if you start unpacking this slide is that up top there, you see that the mandate uh, or the, the emphasis, the focus point is within the organization. The organizations, the funding bodies, performers saying, we have an open science policy or a policy on some of its elements. We have that ourselves. Or if you look in third place, they're saying, uh, typically, this is also part of our mission, strategy, vision documents, you know, open science or open access are mentioned there in some way. So we have that at the organizational level very clearly coming through. At the same time, uh, and that's also why I wanted to start with this slide, you see that there is a heavy emphasis uh, from our organization saying, we are not alone here. We have at national or regional level that is where we also have policies and we do align with those policies or a little bit further behind, just on the 50%, they say, okay, also international policies matter to us. But essentially what you're seeing here is basically these organizations saying we have our own policies, yes, and they are aligned and they interact with the other policies at national, maybe international level. We're talking about a policy framework where there's a lot of interaction between these different levels. That was the first question we asked, it was a really good result. And then the second and already final result that I'm gonna use for this presentation is what is then included in those approaches? If they have a strategic approach, we ask the next obvious question, what is actually included? I think that's where we get to research data, sort of an interesting finding, is we got the following result. Um, these are all the elements that they told us are included in their approaches. And what is really interesting about this, quite a slide, but I think it's unpackable very clearly in, I think, sort of three points, which is first off, if you look at the top right corner, open access to research outputs. Very clearly, almost universal, this is included in their strategic approaches. All of our members are saying, especially if you talk about research articles, but also research data, open access to those outputs, that is almost always included in um, our strategic approaches. If we have an approach and they will have an approach, then that is included. That is sort of unsurprising. These are very traditional, very mature elements of open science. We've been working on these uh, for at least 20 years now with this community. This is unsurprising. The reason I'm also putting this slide here, just to give a bit of context, is that if you then move Further down, if you go to sort of the middle section of this, you start seeing that open science also means more than open access. It is starting to mean more than open access. You look there at the middle section, which is not quite 50% of the members, but just about 50%. 
they say we are also looking into open research infrastructure. This is part of our approach. We look at stakeholder engagement, open source research software, citizen science. So we're slowly sort of taking steps beyond just open access. Open science is starting to mean more than just to open access to outputs. Uh, and that is sort of further confirmed if you move further down to the bottom left corner there, then admittedly we're dropping sort of below 25% of the respondents. But again, you see open evaluation, you see open research methods. Eight and seven of our responding members say, we have a mention of this at the very least. We, we are starting to work on this in our approach to open science. So the point I just want to make here is that uh, today we are obviously going to look at uh, research data. There is still a lot of work to be done there. We I think we all know that the work just isn't done yet. But there is a bigger policy shift out there that open science is now starting to move beyond open access. And we are seeing quite a momentum in just sort of how broad and ambitious this community is becoming. That being said, um, Science Europe, we, we sort of had the same evolution. Uh, since the beginning of our organization, I think research publications was in the very first document already. Like that was immediately open access to research publications. That was a priority for us. So research data came not long behind. We did a lot of work on that. And we have now also shifted to that, again, that umbrella open science and started working on this. Uh, on research data, I want to just sort of touch upon two practical guides that our experts, uh, we, that we created and published together with our experts. The first one, first practical guide is one on international alignment of research data management. We had the original guide, was published in January 2019. And there was an extended guide, I'll get back to that, where we added a chapter uh, to also look at the, uh, well, the reviewers of data management plans. So it was sort of an additional chapter two years later that we added there. Um, but on international alignment of research data management, uh, we published the following practical guides. We started together with our experts, we started from the realization that it is, you know, going to be the public research sector that has to play a leading role here that has a vested interest in making uh, this a success for the future of academic research, basically. Um, but once we said that, we were confronted with the main challenge is that there are different actors involved in this and they all have different needs, different requirements. Uh, funding bodies, research performers, both of those represented within Science Europe, but also individual researchers, reviewers, they have their own needs. They have their own requirements uh, on this topic. The And I'm, I'm really sort of summarizing the summary here, but ultimately uh, through discussions with the experts where they arrived at this, okay, the way we handle this with this practical guide is uh, we provide a common basis to develop aligned RDM policy. That is one thing that this practical guide does. It points towards a common basis and it, it points towards basically the minimum requirements. Um, this is not the, the maximum requirement. This is not a practical guide that says, here is the most ambitious version of this that you can imagine. These are minimum requirements and they're open to be amended, but they are the minimum requirements. If you want to uh, have a uh, basically a policy on this, then this is where you absolutely need to get over the bar. These are the minimum requirements where we start. What is actually in the guide, very briefly, uh, it has four chapters. And as I said, the four chapters sort of came later, two years later was added. We have core uh, requirements uh, for data management plans, the absolute, again, minimum requirements. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but you can, I think if you've not seen the guide, you can sort of look at these at the level of, uh, I'm just looking at them now. These are to do with uh, data description and collection or reuse of existing data documentation and data quality, uh, storage and backup during the research process. That's sort of the level that we're talking about. So the very pointed questions uh, about what are the core requirements for data management plans. Other chapters go into criteria for the selection of trustworthy repositories, uh, guidance for researchers specifically, and then uh, two years later, guidance for uh, the reviewer 
of the MPs. Uh, like, how does that happen exactly? What are the minimum requirements there? So that's how this guide is built up. Um, just to say again, adaptability, uh, these are minimum requirements and they can and should be adapted accordingly. Uh, Science Europe and definitely sort of the, the experts that worked on this were in no way are we sort of jealous, jealously um, safeguarding this guide. It's, 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 this is open to be adapted. Uh, obviously, as I said, it points towards a common basis that should be there for international alignment, but uh, we have opened that door to adaptability in different contexts and, and we actively promote it as well. The second practical guide that, that we published that was around the same time as the extended guide was sustainable research data in June 2021. Uh, just very briefly there as well, uh, sustainability of research data, that is long-term preservation, accessibility, again, absolute key to making a lot of this work in with open research data um, that felt to our experts as a logical next thing to be working on. After we published the original guide on international alignment, sustainability of that research data was a big thing that they wanted to work on and again, have a practical guide on. Uh, a big thing there, it's it was sort of implicit in the, in the first practical guide, um, but here very explicitly, uh, this was seen as a joint responsibility between all the research actors. This is not something that one or the other actor can do by itself. So that was one big point that this practical guide made. This is a joint responsibility and that had an impact in how the guide was developed. Um, RFOs, RPOs, research data infrastructures, they all play an important role. They have that shared responsibility. And the guide ultimately, I'll give an example of what it looks like exactly, but they took the shape of it. I'm sorry, I think my colleague just sort of ran into a wall next door. Um, I don't think you could hear that, but I could. Um, so that took the shape of uh, maturity matrices, uh, which is, again, and you can see there what we're doing. So uh, that means that these matrices that are there, uh, they are guidelines for an individual organization. So this is to support organizations to develop and enhance their own policies and practices. That is one way that this guide can be used for you and your organization to check how are we doing. But at the same time, think back of that sort of shared responsibility that came through very explicitly in this guide is it's complementary. Um, we are encouraging organizations to use these uh, matrices for discussion and collaboration with their partners to make sure that they have um, a shared platform, shared language when they start talking to each other about how to develop this further as a shared effort, as a shared uh, responsibility. And these matrices, uh, this is sort of what they look like. And that's mostly, I think, where I'm going to end it is you have there the different areas uh, that are included, the uh, organizational engagement and commitment, the policy environment, the financial aspects, training, technical preparedness, and communication and awareness raising. For all of those, you have the progression steps then also included in the practical guides where you have plans to develop, development is ongoing, or this is developed at an organizational level. Um, just very bare bones. Obviously, the practical guide itself is much more extensive, much more detailed about this. But just to give you, for this presentation, a first idea of here is how this guide was built, why it was built in a certain way, and just to give you this as here's how it looks when you uh, download and open the guide if you've not done so already. I think that's it for my opening presentation and I will give the floor back to our moderator. Thank you, Brett, so much for your presentation. Um, Julia uh, Malagu Malaguernera, really sorry. I can start with the first oh, question. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I was just looking at my notes. I forgot the whole last bit of it. Uh, sorry, it's very briefly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, as you were saying, like, oh, wait, there's another thing here. Um, there was a little bit at the end that I wanted to say in terms of next steps. Uh, I'll just very briefly uh, touch upon this now that I have a moment. Um, 
So um, as I said, we, we've worked on this in the past. Uh, these practical guides are a couple of years old. They are still heavily used. Uh, so we know that uh, among our membership and also beyond our membership, we do know that these are being used, uh, that they try to align new policies with what is in these practical guides, which, make, which makes perfect sense because it is, again, the experts from our members that have developed this. You know, It makes perfect sense for them to then develop these practical guides in a way that's useful to them. Um, it's a couple of years ago. We have since uh, moved our focus to a couple of other things uh, within sort of the open science framework. As I said, um, our leadership wanted to look at that broader umbrella. That being said, we are slowly trying to get back to this. Um, we have in the last year, some of you might have seen that, we had a briefing paper on research software uh, one of sort of these emerging elements, we we published that. Uh, and as we were developing that, that was, that was not a full practical guide. That was really just like a briefing paper on what is the situation with software? What do we need to take into account if we uh, go into that? Once we'd finished that, um, there was the idea, well, software and data, obviously these are different things. They, they have different requirements, but they're also not entirely separate uh, within sort of the open access lens. There, there are some areas of overlap there. So there has been based on that an idea that at least for 2025, uh, which is basically tomorrow, uh, in our work plan, we do have an item with our members, with our experts to say, might we want to revisit these practical guides? Uh, is that time to revisit them? I can't right now say anything one way or the other. It will will it will be dependent on what our experts say, but we will have a meeting to discuss that. And that is just the final thing I wanted to say and forgot is that we are slowly taking steps to get back to this work. Uh, and hopefully uh, at some point in the future, you will see an update to these practical guides. It's something for next year. Um, We'll see how it goes. Uh, maybe they say, nope, these are still perfectly fine, but it is possible that we will come out with a brief update to these guides uh, in the near future. Sorry for forgetting to say that. Thanks, Brett, because uh, one of uh, the questions that we had uh, was exactly uh, what are the next activities in Science Europe concerning uh, the data management plan? Uh, so it's very interesting uh, to see the surveys that you have presented and uh, the, the work that uh, you are thinking to do for the next year. Uh, if uh, you have uh, some uh, preliminary results, uh, I invite uh, you and your community uh, to propose um, a session in the next Open Science Fair that will be held uh, in uh, uh, at CERN uh, on the 15th, 17th September. Uh, so even the uh, all the people from uh, this community call who would like to support uh, this kind of discussion, please uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, exactly. It's it's uh, we'd we'd love to contribute to that. Um, just again, maybe very briefly to take a, a little bit of a step back is that we are taking steps to revisit research data and go into a little bit more detail compared to what we've done in the last couple of years. But this will also be part of us unpacking the survey results. I, I just gave you sort of like the first two of a much longer report. Um, in 2025, a big part of our work is going to be, going to, be to unpack those results. Um, you know, I think the results that I presented, um, if you look at them very critically, you say, well, yes, that makes sense. It makes sense that these are elements of an open science approach. But for example, what does that actually mean? Um, it That it's part of, between brackets, of an approach could mean anything between there is a mention somewhere or there is an active policy on that. I think open access to publications and to data, that's really on the side of, okay, There's that's mature. There are active policies on that, dedicated policies, I should say. And then others might just be a mention. But that's sort of one of those things that we're going to start unpacking. And in that framework, uh, we are trying to get to research data, as I said. We're also looking into a couple of those other elements. 
um, that, that we're really interested in starting to work on. Um, I specifically pointed out open evaluation, open research methods. Uh, maybe those become the practical guides of the future. Uh, maybe that's where we can sort of move the needle a little bit uh, in the coming years. But that just to give you an idea of 2025 at, uh, at Science Europe. And if I remember well, you are also part uh, of uh, the COARA working groups. So maybe you are thinking also about that, do you? Yes. Um, actually, uh, this this is a colleague of mine uh, because Open Science is uh, the Science Europe decided that Open Science is quite a broad enough portfolio for one person. Uh, so there is a colleague doing research culture, uh, and a big part of that is then research assessment reform, and that is Coada. Um, on the connection to that, that is closely connected, of course. Uh, like it's it's perfectly normal that you bring that up because that is. Clearly, I think that's sort of the colleague that I worked the most with, basically. Um, I didn't present those results, but the survey uh, was that colleague James Morris and I doing that uh, together. And a lot of the questions there, a lot of the results that we have there were also based on not just um, open science as such and then which elements of open science are there. There's also quite a lot of information there about open science and its contribution to uh, the research culture and a more open research culture. Uh, that's one of the things in Science Europe that we very much uh, emphasize in our work, I think, is that even though on occasion with these practical guides, we will really go into detail and we will try and develop these practical guides that are like instantly usable for our own members and other organizations, we also keep an eye on that uh, open uh access to publications open access to research data that ultimately it's a means to an end ultimately the the goal is to have an open research culture where you also have open evaluation open research methods open research outputs uh, that is sort of you know more that the goal is the research culture and and all these other things are sort of means to an end in that direction. Research assessment reform, as you mentioned, is a big part of that. Um, I think that is why it's another priority at Science Europe. And together, it is also in the function of what are we ultimately after? What type of research culture, with which values of a research culture do we want in the future? Thank you. And um, uh, I have uh, here also some other questions. Um, what do you uh, feel um, in the land in this uh, current uh, landscape uh, that uh, we need in order to implement the DMP from uh, researchers level, founders, data stewards, uh, um, research performing organization? Um, big question. Uh, <laughs> We, we actually, we asked, not specifically on the MPs, but we asked in general uh, some of the challenges um, that our members face in, in implementing open science policies. And obviously da open data is like a big part of that. Um, based on that, um, I can say that I think our members were quite clear that the challenges, the concerns they have, for the future development of, of open science in general, but definitely also DMPs, which takes quite a lot of time and effort to develop and develop properly. Um, our members indicated, I think, across the board, uh, both in the development and implementation phase, uh, sort of financial concerns. That is a big thing that they highlight. That is always sort of in the back of their minds. There is just a lot of financial means that you need for this. Um, they also really pointed out that um, the impact on researchers and the impact on researchers, their careers was very noticeable. That was like the second big challenge. It was basically two challenges ahead of everything else. That was sort of financial concerns. And then sort of what is the impact on the researcher? What is the impact on uh, their careers? It was a big challenge that our members, again, funding bodies, research performers, but they said that is something we're very, very mindful of, uh, that we cannot forget that. Um, there's then sort of a number of other 
challenges that were sort of mentioned in the survey results. So I'm, I'm happy for people to unpack this, uh, go and look into it because there's just a whole list of these things, but it goes into uh, just the capacity of the organizations themselves. Um, also mentioned, um, I have to be a little bit careful how I, I frame this out of context, but uh, one thing is also um, the sort of lack of awareness and even outright resistance from the research community themselves. Um, that is, I'm, I'm saying I have to be careful there because it's definitely something that we have to unpack further in, in, in uh, workshops and discussions with our members. Like what do they actually mean by that? But it is noticeable throughout the survey results that they do indicate this as, as that is something that they at the very least are familiar with, that there is either a lack of awareness or uh, some active pushback from research communities themselves. Um, it's something to unpack in the future um, because again, well, I'll, I'll say it now very, very clearly, the survey results are descriptive. They are a basis for discussion next year and in the year after that with our members so we don't quite have like the the truth behind these results but it is something that we've noticed in the results and it's something we're going to take on in um in those discussions and and to your question then okay what is sort of you know what, what are the challenges here i think those are like the main ones uh we just sort of need to unpack them now and sort of really see what does that mean and as we try to get back to research data, try and see specifically for DMP what that actually means. Thank you, Brett. Um, we have uh, one question from uh, uh, Teresa Kilsipak from uh, Umea University in uh, Sweden. I don't know if uh, Teresa, would you like uh, uh, to speak directly and ask your question or uh, if you prefer me to read it? Well, thank you. Um, yes, I, I would be happy to, to ask this question in person. Um, I would like to ask if you at Science Europe possibly have discussed how we can practice open science in times of crisis. The ongoing war in Ukraine affects our work with open science on different levels and the demands for security become higher. That might surely differ between different European countries and different organizations. Um, but uh, at our organization, this is a topic. And uh, I would like to ask if you have discussed this question or if you are going to discuss it. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. I, I love this question because uh, it gives me an opportunity to talk about a little part of my work that is uh, absolutely, we are working on this. We are looking into this. Um, it's um, entirely justified, the question, uh, because we have seen it. So I, again, I'm based in Brussels. I have most of my attention on EU policy discussions. And with geopolitics being in the state that they are, and especially with war returning to Europe, um, we have seen that there is a discussion that has now really broken through. It, it was sort of there but it is really broken through on dual use research. Uh, dual use research obviously being sort of, you know, research with civilian and military outcomes, uh, potential military outcomes. And in this current climate, in this context, that discussion has very quickly sort of been framed in a way of, well, we need to invest in this more and we need to keep that knowledge secure. We, we cannot give it to people. This needs to be closed down. That was sort of, you saw that discussion go in that direction very, very quickly. And there were communities, policy communities that sort of fairly, very naturally sort of went in that direction. You had uh, people from the defense community saying, yes, of course, we're going to close this research as much as possible because that's the world we live in. Um, what you've seen in, in the last couple of months has been very uh, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic because what you saw then is that the open science community uh, through all of the work over the years now also has enough people that uh, in the policy level that support it or at the very least understand it. Uh, so what you saw was that you now had policymakers. Uh, obviously, we were sort of 
voicing our concerns about this discussion as it was developing, much as, for example, EUA representing the universities, other representative bodies who are voicing our concerns. But even within the European Commission, where you have DGRTD voicing internally uh, their concerns, saying, well, it's not a discussion about open or closed. You have misunderstood open science. Uh, so there were, I think, very constructive discussions very quickly then saying, well, open science means as close as possible, um, as open as possible, obviously, uh, as close as necessary. Uh, and that that shifted the discussion. That became a much more constructive discussion after that, where uh, it's not about, OK, is this open or closed? It became a discussion about, well, yes, the current geopolitical context, war in Europe, and how that then impacts sort of dual use research specifically, it becomes part of a balance that we're trying to find between open and closed. It's not binary, it's not one or the other, we're trying to find a balance. And uh, I think that has been a discussion, it's a discussion that's ongoing, it's not been resolved yet, but it has moved in a much more constructive space. And to give you an example, uh, at the national level where I think that worked really well is uh, in Norway, the uh, defense ministry asked this question at some point. They wanted to know how do we look at our research ecosystem uh, in this context? What do we do with dual use research uh, and open science? And they very deliberately went to uh, their national research funder, so one of our members, RCN, and said, could your open science experts maybe come in and help us with this? And uh, I think that that report is online, and I think it's translated in English. At least I read it at some point, so it must be in English. Um, is that uh, that was a very, very sensible document where you suddenly saw that the discussion became a lot more constructive, a lot more nuanced than just open or closed. They did a, ma a magnificent work where they, everything that I've just said, but they said, well, it's, it's as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And these are new elements in the balance that we're trying to find. Um, and they took a look at the entire research ecosystem. They looked at potential impacts, how that then would translate and how they might nationally organize their research system. Uh, and I, I was very, very impressed by how they managed to do that and get to a very constructive outcome. So I'm optimistic, but, but yes, your question is fully justified. These are discussions that are ongoing. And I would just end with saying in the open science community, uh, we should not be hesitant to make clear that we have something to contribute to those broader policy discussions. It's not, I give the Norwegian example, that is not always the case that open science experts are explicitly brought in. But once you see it happens, good things do happen. We do see very good work coming out of that. Uh, and again, that sort of comes back to open science also as a means to an end. So a part of that discussion, and that's really where I'll end my answer, a part of that discussion is also to make clear that we are not doing open access just because we want open access. We are doing open access, we're doing open science because we think that will improve the research culture, that the quality of research, the impact of research is gonna improve. Policymakers need to hear that message as well. This isn't just a thing that researchers are doing just for themselves. This is something that benefits society in the end as well. So that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, Brad. And uh, I hope, uh, Teresa, you are happy with the uh, answer. Well, thank you so very much. Um, it would be worthwhile to, at another occasion, maybe to discuss how as as open as possible and as close as necessary can look like in different cases. Um, because that is where things get difficult if you need to put things into practice. I'm sure we have this uh, um, um, term in many policies, um, um, but uh, in the operative work of research support, we need to find solutions that are suited for certain cases. And it's there where things get difficult. But that is a dis is another discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I see that Jenny posted uh, in the chat uh, the this article, this this report 
from the Norwegian example that was shared by Brett. So thank you very much. Um, I, Brett, I'm, I have seeing, so I'm seeing the date, and I think that is definitely it because it came around. It came out around summer, basically. Good. Thank you. Um, Yes, so Teresa, also you mentioned uh, practical, like, uh, you know, uh, implementation. And my question, um, well, I have many questions, but let's focus on this one now. <laughs> because uh, in recent years, we see a lot of things that are happening with DMPs. Uh, Science Europe has, has provided this fundamental, you know, resources to work with. Uh, so funders can, you know, have, have adopted it and adapted them to their own needs. But we still see that uh, many researchers are struggling to um, start with a DMP and complete it with content. So I'm also adding here in the chat a report uh, from the Horizon 2020 uh, project, uh, I mean, framework program, sorry. And my question to you is, how do you think we can better support researchers uh, in this? uh <laughs> very preliminary um it's 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 hard representing funding bodies and research performers it's it's, it's a little bit tricky to, to get into that because um obviously there are things like training and all that I, I could sort of say the things that we all know and think of like how can we support them better um as I said, funding bodies and research performers, we know from just the survey we just did that they are mindful of the impact on researchers, on their careers, but also just on, you know, the workload of researchers. They're very mindful of it. Uh, but in terms of like then proactively supporting them, um, there is more and more discussion to engage and reach out to research communities, also be accountable to them more um, as we're developing policies. Those are discussions that are happening. But this is something that will... I think take more time to really develop because funding bodies uh, especially are sort of at a, a little bit removed from these research communities. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's, it's more removed in comparison to um, the, the places for support where researchers would more naturally go. Um, my it, it, sort of my academic background, uh, and this is a while back, uh, but I was funded by the sort of in Belgium by the regional uh, funder, and I I just never went. Like it, it just would not occur to me to contact them ever. That I was hosted by a university, it just officially I was an employee of that. You know, I got my my grant from them. Uh, so that's just not where I went. I went if I had a question. I either went to uh, the library or I went to the doctoral school. Like those are sort of the natural things that I, where I would go. Um, so in that sense, in terms of active support and all that, it's, I think it's sort of a discussion also in how can we work more closely with research libraries and work more closely with doctoral schools uh, to make sure that if we have these policies uh, and approaches that how are they then translated in terms of like clear communication, clear advice and support towards the researchers. I know this is a very, very top level question, but until we sort of really start unpacking also these survey results, um, I think that's sort of where I'm gonna leave it. I just, I really don't mean this in a negative way that we're a little bit further removed. Um, it really is in comparison to libraries, doctoral schools, which I think we all know that's sort of where researchers more naturally go for advice. At least that has been also my experience. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much for this, uh, for this answer. So my question was, if, if we want to put it in the context of the policy was about uh, what are the supporting uh, policy supporting material that we can provide apart from the templates, maybe we need something else, maybe we need uh, a structure like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, we've 
done in the practical guide, and obviously we have that chapter on the international alignment where there are guidelines for researchers specifically, uh, and also for reviewers, uh, which is also something that comes up quite often once DMPs are in function, somebody also does need to review them. Uh, that That is not an easy feat either, uh, more support is needed there as well. Um, I, I would rather have sort of basically members of ours uh, give more detailed information there. Like I'm not just sort of at that level how that is implemented exactly. Uh, but but the the question is fair. Uh, it's it's we have these chapters in the practical guides for a reason. And um, maybe that is one of the things that we can take into the discussion next year as well is how have the, has this been implemented? Uh, specifically, because very often we hear, yes, we have used the practical mm. guides. It it would probably be an interesting part of the discussion to also look at exactly how has each of these chapters been uh, implemented. Very good, thank you. Uh, I have more questions, but I would like to give the chance to <laughs> the participants to also ask their questions. And I don't see if we have in the document, please raise your hand. If you want to ask your question also, that's a possibility. Otherwise, uh, I can continue because you mentioned uh, open evaluation, sustainability, uh, and open research methods. And all these contribute uh, also to the reproducibility. And reproducibility has become, uh, you know, uh, it, we see it at least from the European Commission side, we see it uh, um, being um, uh, encouraged uh, more than before. So my question is, and we also actually work, uh, we, we have Argos that works to implement some uh, ma data management plans, but more focused on reproducibility in the context of the tier two project. So my, my question is, uh, how can we address this topic? How can we put all these different elements that can support the producibility inside the DMP? Do you think this is um, this is something uh, that uh, you could uh, also you, you could also see it happening in the new the next steps that you mentioned at the beginning? Just unmute myself. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is yes, perhaps. Um, but I, do, I don't want to preempt sort of the conversation. Um, I think that is sort of where you run into, um, we are going to open the conversation with our members and, and they're going to have to guide us a little bit in terms of uh, if the practical guides need updating, need expansion, perhaps. What have we seen since uh, 2021 that they feel needs to sort of be included more, emphasized more. Um, that's a discussion that I'm definitely looking forward to. The, the, the things that you mentioned, like they might be a part of that. I, I don't know at this point, uh, but they definitely, it stands to reason that these elements are sort of considered uh, for uh, more emphasis, of course. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one question here. Um, I don't know who uh, is uh, the, the person, so I'm reading it. Uh, following up uh, on the policy to practice gap, which uh, time frames do you believe are realistic before policy effects can be evaluated? It's a really good question. <laughs> There's no answer to it, but it's a really good question. Um, it's it's actually this morning during a meeting, I was even talking about this um, in, in, a, in a different context, but like, when are we evaluating? Um, we, it, I'll give you the example. This was on, on a publication platform that is being revamped. And uh, there was an idea of like, we should definitely have an evaluation, a big evaluation after five years um, of, of how this platform has evolved. And then almost instantly people said, that seems very long. That that seems, because uh, it's quite a big change that we're introducing into the platform. 
um, five years seems long. And then you've had, then I think we've had a very sensible conversation about midterm evaluations, um, about evaluating on a rolling basis. Um, when would you be able to see the actual outcomes of, of policy changes? Um, on the one hand, you could say you need a much longer time frame than five years to really see the out the, the changes from a policy coming out of a policy. On the other hand, you don't want to wait very long to start making incomplete evaluations. Um, as long as you're sort of aware that we are working with sort of incomplete outcomes we don't know, but you can sort of look at the direction of travel uh, and already have an idea there and then sort of start steering things in the right direction if necessary. Um, the survey, again, I keep coming back to the survey, there was a, um, they had three parts, uh, three parts, basically, survey. The first was strategic approaches. I gave you some results there. Research assessment, how all of this is implemented through research assessment was a second big part. And then uh, a third part, which was a little bit less substantial, but it was still very important for us to have it in there, was uh, open science monitoring and evidence gathering for open science. Um, the reason we had that in there uh, with a number of questions, uh, even though it sort of it gets less attention than the strategy approaches, it gets less attention than research assessment at this point. But monitoring and evidence gathering, we felt was very important to still have those questions and those discussions in the next year because as open science policies and practices become more ambitious, they become more widespread we are going to have to prioritize monitoring and evidence gathering a lot more in the future than we've done in the past. Luckily, we have seen from the results that uh, at least among funding bodies and research performers, our members, uh, a majority does have monitoring mechanisms in place already. They are heavily focused on publications and data, as you can imagine, uh, but there are core mechanisms in place there already. And those are gonna be very, very important or uh, as you have these policies impacting more and more researchers, impacting their careers more, um, to have these monitoring practices there, have them uh, fine-grained enough to almost act as early warning signals before you do a proper evaluation. So there's just a couple of things there that, that we're also sort of addressing in the survey as, yes, this is something to really pay attention to in the future. Thank you, Brecht. Uh, as we can see, there is also another question from Teresa. Um, would you like to uh, say it again on your own, or would you like me to read it? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that question is a bit about assessment of research. We have um, in our documents the, the for the appointments procedure of teachers, so far, open science not included as a criterion for expertise that qualifies if people apply for jobs. Um, certainly, open science fits in indirectly, but um, it's not there as an individual point that would count. Um, have you, at Science Europe, discussed this question, how that could be resolved in practice? Um, and here, it, it might make sense to discuss this on a higher level, because if one leaves this task to individual organizations, well, but it, yeah, it might be more difficult to, um, to proceed and um, to, to make progress. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that last point is definitely true. Uh, just leaving open science behind for a second, just research assessment reform. Um, there is there is definitely the the danger of a first mover disadvantage there. If you make substantial changes to how you do research assessment, how you evaluate uh, and promote people, then um, that has to be aligned at, at quite a high level so that you wouldn't disadvantage your own researchers potentially. Uh, the example there that I'm thinking of, this is something, that, so we know that the Netherlands uh, already a couple of years ago did 
did like a, a vast reform of what they were sort of emphasizing in, in what they wanted from academics. And I know that in that context, they were quite worried at the time that if the rest of Europe would not follow, then they might uh, end up having a research culture, a researcher in that culture that sort of that they wanted to promote, but that those people would then sort of go into other national systems with a CV and a track record that would not be understandable in those other systems. So that sort of first mover disadvantage was a real thing that they were very worried about. And luckily, the time was was there then in Europe with COARA to have that coalition for research assessment reform. And that, that, would, that did become a European discussion in the end. Uh, but that was like a real thing that they were uh, fearful of. Uh, and that I think it's still probably on their minds. The COARA, they're heavily engaged there to make sure that that discussion about research assessment reform is held at that level. Um, looking back at open science within research assessment, um, the survey has quite a lot on that, I should say. Uh, we have had uh, extensive questions to our members about how, obviously, they, they have, they do address open science within research assessment. It is a part of every step of it. Um, but that, again, means very different things. That can mean very different things. That could be um, there are approaches that are very proactive with, with sort of dedicated questions about how have you contributed to open science in this and this way. So sort of explicit questions, dedicated criteria that exists. There are also more passive approaches where uh, they tell us, yes, we, we are going to look at elements of open science if they are mentioned in a narrative CV. Like we are happy to look at that if they are mentioned, but we are not sort of dedicating points or a criteria to this. So it can mean very different things that this is included in research assessments. In terms of what is then the direction of travel, where do we want to go with this? Uh, that is impossible to answer at this point. Um, I think that is sort of up to the members to decide. Um, again, the, the, the survey is very explicitly descriptive in nature we don't make sort of a, a case for what should be the direction in the future in the survey itself uh, because i think reasonable people can differ in opinion um, reasonable people can have a difference in opinion in terms of um, if you look at all the elements of open science um, i think some of our organizations might say well element xyz is very important to us. And we are gonna very proactively have policies on this. We're gonna proactively promote this through research assessment. Other funding bodies might say X, Y, Z are different to us. Like we are different elements that we'd like to emphasize. Um, so there's not sort of one answer to that. Uh, we don't wanna sort of impose anything in that regard. We wanna keep that open and flexible uh, between our members. Um, there's also obviously the case that um, if, if funding bodies put this in their research assessment practices, um, do they do that for all their funding lines or just some of them? That's also something that's sort of addressed in the survey. Um, so it, it becomes a whole complex thing, but looking at it from the top level, it's not a bad thing that there's a lot of complexity there. It, it gives a lot of flexibility to our members to look based on these results as well to sort of say, well, there are certain things we are going to emphasize. There's other things we are happy to acknowledge if they are mentioned in a narrative CV, but we are not going to prioritize them. And for another member, it's going to be the opposite. That that might be the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good. Uh... We should be wrapping up, I see now. We only have one minute and we don't want to keep uh, everyone uh, logging to that. We have next month to look forward to <laughs> for more discussions. But um, to wrap up, um, since evaluation and assessment is a, is, a, is a, what was the topic, maybe I can, um, some of you already know, uh, maybe I can raise awareness again for the OS Trails project that uh, Opener is coordinating. Uh, 
and it's uh, realized uh, in collaboration with 40 diverse uh, uh, research performing organizations, funders, uh, companies. And one of the things that we're looking at is DMP evaluation. So um, we would like to understand how we can semi-automate this. What are the elements that we want that we need to look at? Is it if a, if a DMP mentions a data set and if the data set mentions a, a license and so on? So let's, I think, keep that in mind. And maybe if we could, uh, Brecht, if this is in your uh, also interest for next year, uh, let us know. Uh, we are all happy to uh, collaborate uh, on this. And yeah, thank you very, very much. Um, hope everyone enjoyed this uh, fruitful discussion and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.